Philippine Pharmaceuticals in association with Higher Secondary Principals Forum. Hi friends and welcome to the history class brought to you by Prudent Media in collaboration with the Principals Forum. I'm Luisa Pereira, teacher from Raghuveer and Premavati Salkar High Secondary School, Shoram. Today, I'm going to explain to you chapter number four from your history book, part two. The name of the chapter is Through the Eyes of the Travelers. If you see the weightage for the chapter, it is six marks. Two questions will appear from this chapter, one for two marks and the other for the four marks. However, there is a choice for the four mark question over here. Two questions will come for four marks. You have to answer any one. So total two plus four, six marks. Now coming to the chapter through the eyes of travelers, as the name suggests, we are going to learn about the various travelers that came to India between the 10th and the 17th century. We are going to learn about their observations, what observations they made about the Indian society, and of course, how they compared the Indian society to the other cultures. Now, some of the travelers who came to India between the 10th and the 17th century were Al Biruni. One of them was Al Biruni, who came to India in the 11th century. He was from Khwarizm, which is today called as Uzbekistan. The second traveler who came to India was Ibn Battuta. He came in the 14th century. He was from Morocco in Africa. And the third traveler that we are going to learn today is François Bernier, who was from France, who came to India in the 17th century. Now, all these travelers, they came to India, they made observations about India, and they brought their respective books. For example, we have Al-Biruni who wrote his book known as Kitab ul Hind, which was in the Arabic language. Ibn Battuta's travel accounts were Rihala, which was also written in the Arabic language. And François Bernier wrote Travels in the Mughal Empire, which was in the French language. Now let us study each one of them in detail. We will first take up Al-Biruni. Now, Al Biruni, he came to India in the 11th century. As I told you, he was born in Khwarizm, which is today called as Uzbekistan. Now, this place, Khwarizm, was an important center for learning. And being an important center for learning, Al Biruni himself took up the best of the education. He was a well educated man and he learned many, many languages, such as the Arabic the Persian, Sanskrit, the Syrian, Hebrew, and so on. Now what happened is that in the year 1017, Sultan Muhammad of Ghazni, he invaded Khwarizm. And he took many of the scholars from Khwarizm to his capital, Ghazni. And Al-Biruni was one of them. It was in Ghazni that Al-Biruni developed interest in India. Now when Punjab became a part of the Ghaznavid Empire, Al-Biruni came to India. As I told you that he had developed his interest when he was in Ghazni. So now he came to India. And in India, he made friendship with many Brahmin priests and scholars, and he learned Sanskrit from them. He also studied the religious and the philosophical texts in Sanskrit. Now he traveled the Punjab and the northern parts of India and collected a lot of information about the Indian society. And he wrote his book, Kitab ul Hind, in the Arabic language. Now let us learn something about the book itself, Kitab ul Hind. This book, Kitab ul Hind, is divided into 80 chapters and it deals with various subjects such as religion, philosophy, festivals, astronomy, manners, traditions, customs, social life, laws, and so on. 
What is most important about Kitab ul Hind is that Al Biruni he began each of the chapter in his book with a question, followed by the description based on the Sanskrit traditions, and he concluded each of his chapter by comparing whatever he observed in India with that of the other cultures. Now let us see what are some of the problems that Al Biruni faced in understanding the Indian society. Now for example, I told you that when he came to India, he learned Sanskrit language from Brahmin priests and Brahmin scholars. Now one of the major problems for him was the language problem. It was very, very difficult for him to translate the ideas and the concepts from Sanskrit language to the Arabic language. Why? Because this language, the Sanskrit language, was very, very different from the Arabic language as far as the vocabulary is concerned. And so, it was very difficult for him to translate certain concepts and ideas from the Sanskrit language to the Arabic language. The second problem what Al-Biruni faced was that he found that the religious beliefs and the practices in India were far more different from that of the Arabic world. And so he found it very, very confusing. The third problem what Al-Biruni faced was the self-absorption of the Indian population. Now when we talk about the self-absorption of the Indian population, what do we mean? The people of India were so preoccupied with their own feelings that it was very difficult for Al-Biruni to understand them. The deep feeling that the people had about their own beliefs, about their own customs, it was very difficult for Al-Biruni to understand the Indian society. Now, in spite of all these problems, Al-Biruni, he depended on the works of the Brahmanas in order to provide an understanding of the Indian society. So he mostly referred to the works of the Brahmanas to give us the information about the Indian society. Now let us see how Al-Biruni describes the Indian society as far as the caste system is concerned. Now when he gives us the information about the caste system in India, he mostly does it by comparing it to the other cultures. Now for example, we all know in India, amongst the Hindus, there are four castes. The topmost are the Brahmanas, followed by the Kshatriyas, the Vaishyas, and the Shudras. Now what Al-Biruni tells us is that this caste system was not unique only to India, but this caste system was prevalent in the other societies also. And the best example that he gives us is about ancient Persia. He tells us that in ancient Persia also, they followed the caste system. So this caste system is not unique only to India, but the caste system is also followed by the other societies. Now some of the castes that were prevalent in ancient Persia are, I mean, there were four castes. The first one was that of the knights and the princes. The second one was that of the monks, the priests and the lawyers. The third caste was that of the physicians, that are doctors, astronomers, and the scientists. And the fourth caste was that of the peasants and the artisans. Al-Biruni also tells us, though this caste system was there, in Islam, all men were treated equally, meaning there was no social division in Islam. Now, we will go further to know more about Al-Biruni. Al-Biruni, he was deeply influenced by the study of the normative Sanskrit text, which laid down the rules governing the system from the views of the Brahmanas. As I told you that he made friendship with the Brahmanas, the Brahmin priests, the, the Brahmin scholars. Okay, And so he was deeply influenced by the study of the normative Sanskrit text which laid down the rules governing the system as per the views of the Brahmanas. However, one thing he did not agree with them 
was the system of unholiness, the concept, the idea of unholiness. That is, he criticized the notion, the idea of pollution. For example, just as the sun cleanses the air and the salt in the sea cleans or prevents the water from being polluted, in the same way, according to Al-Biruni, everything which falls into the state of impurity strives and succeeds in regaining its original form of purity. Otherwise, what would have happened? There would have been no life on earth. Life on earth would have been impossible. So this concept of social pollution, which is there in the caste system, was against the law of nature. So we have seen, though Al-Biruni was deeply influenced by the Sanskrit texts of the Brahmanas, he was against the idea of pollution. Now we will study about the second traveler who visited India, and that is Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta came to India in the 14th century. He was from Morocco in Africa. He came to India in the year 1333. Before coming to India, he had traveled many, many places. He was coming from a well-educated family, so he himself was a well-educated man. He was very adventurous and he loved traveling. Now what Ibn Battuta tells us is that if you want to know more about the other societies, about the other cultures, then the knowledge of books is not enough. Reading books it is not enough. What is important is that you have to travel to know the other societies better. So he gave a lot of importance to traveling and he himself traveled to many countries to know about the different societies, about the different cultures. Now when he reached Sindh in India in the year 1333, he heard about Muhammad bin Tughlaq who was the Sultan of Delhi. And he came to know about Tughlaq's love for art and literature. So what did he do? He set off for Delhi to meet Muhammad bin Tughlaq, who was the Sultan of Delhi. Now Muhammad bin Tughlaq, he himself was impressed by the scholarship of Ibn Battuta, so much so that he made him the Qazi of Delhi. Now what do you mean by Qazi? Qazi means judge. Okay, so Tughlaq was very much impressed by the scholarship of Ibn Battuta, that Ibn Battuta was made the Qazi of Delhi. Now, after visiting many countries before coming to India, and also when in India he visited many countries like China and all, he recorded all his observations about the new cultures, about the people, about the beliefs, about the values, and he penned down in his travel account, which is known as Rihala, which was written in the Arabic language. Now what is important about his book Rihala is that his book Rihala is often compared with the accounts of the European traveler Marco Polo. Now let us see what information Ibn Battuta gives us about the towns and cities. How we spoke about Al-Biruni, who gives us a lot of information about the caste system in India, like that. Ibn Battuta also gives us a lot of information about the Indian cities, the towns during the Mughal period. So he tells us that the Indian cities, okay, or the cities in the Indian subcontinent, they were full of opportunities. They were full of opportunities for whom? They were full of opportunities who were, who were very much ambitious, who were resourceful and skilled. So if they wanted the jobs, the first thing what he wanted was that you should have an ambition to do so, you should be resourceful and you should be skilled. And if you had these three qualities, then you were, the cities were full of opportunities for such type of people. Another thing what Ibn Battuta tells us about the cities is that the cities were densely populated and they were prosperous. Now when I talk about densely populated, what does this mean? The cities were densely populated meaning there was a lot of population in the cities and they were very, very rich. 
Ibn Battuta further tells us that there were crowded streets. The streets were always crowded and the markets were very colorful and they were bright. A lot of or different type of goods were sold over here. So the streets were never without people. They were always crowded. People gathered over there. The markets were full of uh, a variety of uh, goods. And this variety of goods made the markets look very colorful and bright. Further, Ibn Battuta tells us there were two important cities with huge population. First was Delhi and second one was Daulatabad. Now let us see what information Ibn Battuta gives us about the bazaars. Now children, these questions are very important from the examination point of view because each question will come to you like for example, what information Ibn Battuta gives us about the towns and cities, about the bazaars, later on we'll see about the uh, postal system. So that is the reason I have divided them into separate subtopics. So Ibn Battuta gives us the information about the bazaars. So Ibn Battuta tells us that the bazaars were not only the places of economic transaction, but they were also the places of social and cultural activities. Now when I talk about not only places of economic transaction, meaning not only business was carried in the markets or in the bazaars, but social and cultural activities were also held. Special places were marked for the performances by the singers, the musicians, dancers. So special performances were held in the places which were marked for them. Besides this, Ibn Battuta also tells us that most of the bazaars had a mosque, a religious place of worship of the Muslims and also a temple. Now let us see what information Ibn Battuta gives us about the Indian economy. What Ibn Battuta tells us about the Indian economy is that agriculture in India was very, very prosperous. And why was agriculture very prosperous? If agriculture had to be prosperous, that means the land should be fertile. And the Indian land was very, very fertile. So the soil was very fertile, which made agriculture very prosperous. And it allowed this prosperity, this richness of soil, allowed the farmers to cultivate two crops in a year. The villages cultivated so much, the produce was so much that whatever was surplus, the villages would send it to the towns and cities. So the towns and cities got the wealth from the surplus of the villages. So this is what Ibn Battuta tells us. Now when you are trading the traders, because that time there was no proper uh, means of transport and communication. So it took many days for the tra traders to travel. So they used to get tired, they needed place to rest. And so the trade routes were always covered or supplied with inns and guest houses to help the travelers or the traders. Now let us see what Ibn Battuta tells us about the postal system, what information he gives us about the postal system. Ibn Battuta tells us that the postal system was very, very efficient. This postal system helped not only to send information, but it also helped to remit credit across the long distances, to send money to the long distances, and also to dispatch goods required at a very short notice. So within a short notice, the goods could be dispatched the money could be sent across, all information can be sent across, and this was possible because of the postal system, which was very, very efficient. What Ibn Battuta tells us is that it took them just 50 days to reach any information from Sindh to Delhi. Now, when I talk about this 50 days, you all might say that, my God, so many days, children, now it is possible for us because we have means of transport and communication. But put yourself in that century, 14th century, where there was no development as far as means, and, means of transport and communication is concerned. It had to be done by the runners, by, by men. It was done manually. So 50 days was not much during that period. But if the reports of the spies, the secret reports of the spies had to reach to Sultan, then it would take only five days. 
Now, how do you think that this postal system was carried on? Now, we have what is known as today the relay race. Have you seen the relay race, how it is being done? A person, one, the first runner, runs with a baton a particular distance and then hands over the baton to the second person. The second person runs a particular distance, hands over the baton to the third person. In the same way, this postal system was carried out. One person used to run with the information, with the letter or a parcel to a particular distance and hand over that parcel or information to the second person. Second person used to run and hand it over to the third person. In this way, the postal system was carried out. Now we move on to the other traveler who visited India and that was François Bernier. François Bernier visited India in the 17th century and he was from France, of course, an European. He was a doctor, a political philosopher and a historian by profession. Now, since he was a doctor, he was appointed as a physician to Prince Dara Suko. Now, this Dara Suko was the son of Emperor Shah Jahan. And Shah Jahan appointed François Bernier as a physician to his son Dara Suko. Now, whatever François Bernier observed about India, all his observations are penned down in his work, The Travels in the Mughal Empire. And what he has done in his work is that Whatever he has observed, he has tried to compare it with the European society. So his entire work about India, his observations about India is compared with that of the European society. Now let us see what were his observations on India. Now whatever he observed, okay, François Bernier's observations, whatever he saw, he described it as a bleak situation as compared to the developments in Europe. He was not very happy with the Indian society. He felt that Indian society was far, far more backward compared to the European society. And he gives reason also for this. What he says is that the main reason for this backwardness or for this difference between the Indian society and the European society is the lack of private property of land in India. Meaning, in India, the land was not owned by the private people, but the land was owned by the king, by the emperor, by the state. So the people did not benefit from it. And what did the emperor or the king do? The king used to distribute this land amongst his nobles, and the nobles in turn used to distribute the land amongst the peasants. So the peasants were not the actual owners of the land. The actual owners of the land was the king. So this land, the peasants were aware how much hard they work. The land will never pass to their children. The property will not pass to the children. So they did not take much interest as far as the improvement of the land is concerned or investment in the land is concerned. So the produce was also not up to the mark because they did not work hard because there were no incentives that were given to them. They were not happy because they were not the actual owners of the land. So all this, what happened because of all this, the consequences of the lack of private ownership of land because of this, what happened? There was total destruction of the Indian economy. Agriculture suffered, people suffered, even these new landlords, so-called so new landlords because the lands were given to them, they also could not improve their position. And there was a decline in the standard of living. And all this happened because of the lack of private ownership of land. Now what happened was that most of the people lived in poverty and very few people, that is the aristocrats, only they were rich. So what Bernier further says is that there were very few rich people in India and majority of the people in India were poor. So what he says is that there were either very rich people or very poor people. There was no middle class in India that we have today. Okay. So what Bernier says, there were very rich people in India and very poor, no middle class in India. Now, since majority of the people in India were poor, Bernier further goes and says that 
the Mughal emperor was the king of the beggars and barbarians because majority of the people, people in India were poor. So whose king is he? Whose emperor is he? He is the king of the beggars and the barbarians, the uncivilized people. This is what he said. Further, Bernier gives us information about the towns and cities. He says that the Indian towns and cities were contaminated. They were ruined. There was a lot of pollution, air pollution. The fields were spread with bushes and marshes. And all this is because the land was owned by the crown. Now let us see what Bernier have to say about the Mughal state in India. Now Bernier tells us that the Mughal state had a complex social reality. Now what is this complex social reality? The reality was that the artisans had no incentives. There was no incentive given to the artisans. They had to manufacture the produce. The profits were taken by the state. So they did not get any profit. So naturally they were disappointed. They did not work hard because their profits were taken by the state. Bernier also tells us that the Mughal cities, uh, or he describes the Mughal cities as camp towns. Now what do you mean by camp towns? Camp towns means those people who lived in the towns, they owed their existence and depended for their survival on the imperial patronage. So they totally depended for their survival on the imperial patronage and that is why he calls these towns as camp towns. Bernier also tells us that there were many kinds, different kinds of towns in India, in Mughal India like manufacturing towns, there were trading towns, there were port towns, there were religious towns and so on. He tells us that each of the community in India, they had, they formed their own occupational bodies. So each of the community, they formed their own occupational bodies. For example, he tells us about Western India that all the merchants came together and they formed their own occupational body. They called themselves as Mahajans and the chief of the Mahajans was called as Shet. Bernier also tells us that different type of people lived in the urban areas like the physicians that are the doctors, teachers, lawyers, painters, architects, musicians and so on. So different type of people lived in the urban areas according to Bernier. Now let us see what information the foreign travelers gives us about women and slavery in India. When we talk about women and slavery in India, we are especially going to learn about what Ibn Battuta and Franco Bernier has to tell us about the Indian women and slavery. Now what this travelers tells us, especially Ibn Battuta is that the female slaves were openly sold in the markets and these female slaves were exchanged as gifts. He himself tells us, he himself gives us his example. He says that when he went to meet Emperor or Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq, he purchased variety or many horses or camels and female slaves and gave them as a gift to Sultan Muhammad bin Tughlaq. So female slaves were openly sold in the market. He also tells us that female slaves were used as experts or they were experts in music and dance. So they were used for the entertainment purpose as far as music is concerned, singing is concerned and dance is concerned. Ibn Battuta also tells us that slaves were used as domestic labor. They were used in the houses uh, to work as domestic labor. He also tells us that some women were specially employed by the Sultan to keep a check on his nobles. Now let us see what François Bernier have to tell us about women. He tells us that Sati was practiced in India. Now what is this Sati? Sati is something where the husband dies and when the husband dies, the woman, that is his wife, jumps on the funeral pyre and she herself dies. Now what he tells us is that some women uh, cheerfully committed sati out of their own wish but some women were forced to die. They were forced into the funeral pyre of the husband. Now with this we have completed the chapter. Let us have the brief summary of this chapter. In this chapter through the eyes of the travelers we have 
learned about the three travelers who visited India and what did they observe about the Indian society. So one of the traveler who visited India in the 11th century was Al Biruni. He was from Khwarizm, which is today called as Uzbekistan. Whatever he has observed is penned down in his book known as Kitab ul Hind, which is written in the Arabic language. He also learned Sanskrit with the help of the Sanskrit, uh, with the help of the Brahmin priests and scholars. And he learned about the Indian caste system. And he tells us this caste system is not unique only to India, but caste system is also prevalent in the other societies. And he gave us the best example of ancient Persia. Though he was deeply influenced by the study of the Brahmanas, the Sanskrit texts, he also criticized pollution. He was against the idea of pollution, which is against the laws of nature. Then we have Ibn Battuta who came to India in the 14th century. He was from Morocco in Africa. He was a well-educated man. And he also traveled many places because according to him, traveling is very important to know about any society or any culture. Whatever he wrote was based on his observations. The name of his book was Rihala, which was written in the Arabic language. Then he also spoke about the towns and cities. He told us that the Indian towns and cities were densely populated. The crowds, it, the streets were crowded. There were colorful markets. He also spoke about the bazaars. He tells us that the bazaars were used not only for economic transaction, but also for social and cultural activities. He also told us about agriculture, that agriculture was very, very prosperous. The land was very fertile. And because of the fertility of the land, the farmers could grow two crops in a year. Then he also told us about the postal system, which was very, very efficient. Coming to François Bernier, who came to India in the 17th century, he was from France. He observed and he wrote whatever he observed about the Indian society in his book Travels in the Mughal Empire in the French language. Now since he was a doctor by profession, a physician, he was appointed as a, as a physician to Prince Dara Sukho, son of Emperor Shah Jahan. Now he told us that the main problem in India is the lack of private ownership of land. He tried to compare the Indian society with that of the European society. And he said that if at all the Indian society is backward, Indian agriculture is backward, whatever it is, it is only because the land is owned by the king, by the crown, and not by the people. He also tells us that there were two classes in India, that is, people were either very rich or they were very poor, and there was no middle class in India. He further describes the Mughal cities as camp towns because the people who lived in these towns, they depended for the survival on the imperial patronage. Then we have information by these travelers on women and slavery, wherein we are told that women, the female slaves, were sold openly in the market and they were exchanged as gifts. Some of the women who were employed were also experts in singing, dancing, music. Some of them were, uh, were employed to keep a check on the nobles. Some of them were employed as domestic laborers. And François Bernier also tells us that sati prevailed in India. With this, I have completed the chapter. Hope you have understood. Thank you so much. And a big thank you to Prudent Media and Principles Forum for giving me the opportunity to explain this chapter to you. Thank you. Prudent Scholars, powered by Lupin Pharmaceuticals